how are you waiting for things? It's been quite a, a funny topic in many ways to be exploring this week for me. My assumption was that we, we kind of carry a bit of awareness as humans about the fact that we're, you know, not very good at waiting, that like if there's one thing that we could really uh, get better at, it's, it's kind of the, the skill of, of being patient and waiting and, um, you know, being comfortable with the, with the spaces in between the things of our lives. Um, but, you know, like, actually, as I began to research, I was kind of shocked with where, uh, where things started as I began looking around for, for kind of, you know, other people's takes on, on waiting and, and what, what kind of, how we can improve our ability um, to, to wait, you know, become more patient and gracious and able to cope with boredom, boredom and, and so on. But the kinds of things that started emerging were like, you know, waiting is for losers. Uh, bad things come to those who wait was, was another, I think that was an article of something. Good things come to those who don't take no for an answer. Stop waiting, start hustling. You know, all of these kinds of messages. And I was like, oh, these are kind of painful and depressing things to, to stumble upon. You know, I thought they were actually, like when I first saw them, I, I thought there was like sarcasm or irony in the titles. But, but no, they turned out to be sincere. Um, and they, they filled me with a sense of deflation because, you know, wow, this is not the message that we need to hear right now in our world. We're chronically terrible at waiting. And these messages that tell people to avoid waiting, to, to go after what you want, to hustle, to demand the things that you want other people to give you and, and all this sort of stuff, they're not teaching us anything really helpful. They're teaching us to be, to be kind of reckless, to be kind of, you know, douches. Essentially do the damage before someone else gets the chance to do it. Take what you want before somebody else gets in there first. And what depresses me is the fact that there is truth to this. You know, it's true that you can hustle your way to success. You can badger people to the point where they will potentially agree to your requests and you can immerse yourself in busyness to the point where you see results. But that doesn't make these good things. It doesn't make them good for you as a person, for your health, for your attitude, for your long-term well-being, for your relationships. And it certainly doesn't make them good for us as a collective, as a culture. So in this episode, I want to explore the power of learning how to wait. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like more, there's a simple way to show support. It takes me loads of hours each week to make sure that every show's complete. I love to write, record and share and it's really nice to know you care. The best way and it don't take long is to become a Patreon. So visit andymod.com forward slash Patreon. There are four levels you can choose from. Each one unlocks a ton of fun. You become a Patreon, I'll say your name at the end of this song. Visit andymod.com forward slash Patreon. 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 So I guess the, the undertone that I was getting from some of the articles uh, that I mentioned before the break was the assumption that waiting is, is passive. It's giving way to some, someone else because you're weak or you're unable to keep up with the pace or whatever it might be. And actually, I want to argue that waiting is a really active choice. It's a conscious choice to disengage, to step back and to see things as they need to be seen. This is not to say like spend your whole life waiting you know that like we we should act that too is part of this process of waiting it's knowing when to act it's knowing how to act in the most effective way hustle is not often conscious action it's often blind busyness we've got to do something this is the plea of anxiety when the mind needs to act but it doesn't know what it needs to do there is no kind of rational grounding at work here. It just needs to keep busy and do something about the problem, which is not the real problem, but rather the problem of feeling anxious. And the solution, rather than digging into the anxiety as a symptom of something deeper, is to just do something, to do anything, to act. Whether it's, it's a, an extreme obsessive compulsive behavior, like you know, checking that thing you've checked a million times already, 
It might be buying things that you don't really need because they feel like they're going to provide some kind of respite from this anxiety. Or going out somewhere that you don't need to go, but creating a reason for needing to go there. And in the process, probably building unnecessary tasks to keep you distracted from confronting the true issue, which your anxiety is actually trying to communicate to you about. Some people spend their whole lives never truly confronting the roots of anxiety. Some people will hit a boiling point where they cannot help but confront it in you know, therapy or after some big life-changing event. But this is not a, an unusual thing. In fact, anxiety is absolutely everywhere when it comes to avoiding waiting. Something happens to us when unexpected twists and turns occur occur in life. You know, for many of us, we find ourselves desperate to act, to do something, anything. And we do things not because they're the right things to do, but because they are things to do. We must become aware of these moments in our own lives and to proceed with intention and the right level of caution to embrace periods of waiting so that nothing is done with kind of reactionary recklessness, but with control and judgment. In 2010, I was traveling with some friends in, um, around Denmark and Sweden. Um, you may have heard me talk about this before. Um, we were moving towards uh, Stockholm, towards the end of our trip, um, and news was reaching us of Eyjafjallajökull. Jakold. I can still say it, um, I think. A volcano in Iceland, which was erupting with great force. It was sending huge plumes of ash into the sky, and the result was that Planes throughout Europe were basically grounded and there was no, um, there was no flights um, in and around Europe. Like, I was supposed to be getting a flight from Stockholm back to London and there was nothing. Um, it was pretty inconvenient because it was you know, right when we were due uh, to fly home. And in the midst of that moment, we were not alone. We were in, in a hostel and there was people from all over Europe essentially wondering what to do, waiting to hear when the flights would start going again. And for many, this waiting was very painful. It was unbearable. The anxiety was completely overwhelming. The desire to to just do something, to to act, to, to get home became incredibly great. You're looking for all kinds of convoluted alternatives. I, I don't know if you've seen um, Home Alone, it's a kind of niche cult film from the 90s, um, I'm pretty sure you've probably seen Home Alone. Uh, But it it was a lot like that when Kevin's mother uh, will essentially do anything to get back from Paris to Chicago, even though the the actual, the the most instant thing she can do is um, fly somewhere else and then uh, kind of bribe someone. I, I think she bribes somebody to give them, give her their seat on a flight into somewhere else in America. And then she meets the, the band of, um, (laughs) <laughs> the polka band um, where who give her a lift back to Chicago. And then she ends up arriving home at the same time as the rest of the family who, who just waited for the next flight direct from Paris to Chicago uh, the next morning. I imagined, uh, you know, this is, is kind of the same with enormous expense for the extra travel um, and, and different transport. And there were those who, you know, getting trains and buses down to Brussels. They were like, right, we, we've got to get back to the UK. So we're going to get the Eurostar from Brussels to London and then onwards wherever they need to go from there. And they were just not thinking about how much money that, that would cost them and not thinking, actually, we're probably not going to get there any faster. And in the process, there's probably a lot of people, a lot of like-minded people who are going to be trying to get on the Eurostar and the next available one with, with seats will probably be... Um, a few days after we could catch our flight once the flights start going again. Um, and so, you know, within all of this, I decided, you know, we're going to, we're, we're just going to wait this out. There was nothing that we could do of any great, great value. I wasn't going to, you know, get involved in the, the kind of hysteria, the, the, the panic, panic traveling. Um, I mean, there was plenty we could do, but none of it seemed sensible at any level. So I literally just 
lay on a sofa and waited, um, watching the, the kind of panic ensue around us. Now, I understood that, you know, people were obviously in predicaments. People, it was, it was a real challenge. There, was, there were all sorts of reasons why people needed to get home and, and you know, like when they, when they wanted to, when they'd planned to. Um, and there was no sense of like, you know, belittling that. It was like, no, this is a, a serious problem. But doing stuff wasn't actually solving the problem. And this was the issue, especially given that we'd been told that the, the, the ash cloud was pr- probably going to be clear enough within, within two or three days maximum. It turned out we only needed one extra night in the, in the hostel. And actually, we, we had a lot of fun, those of us who were sticking around um, as we did so. So in the end, we would definitely have arrived back in the UK about 24 hours or more um, before you could have done if you'd caught the Eurostar from Brussels. And, you know, we didn't have to obviously pay any extra for the rearranged flight. If you meditate, then you'll have experience of waiting. In fact, waiting is the lesson. It's the thing. You might approach it with the expectation that you're waiting for something to happen. But really, the thing that is going to happen is the thing that is happening. The stillness, the silence, the solitude. You're not waiting for an epiphany. You're not waiting for, for God to appear. You know, that's a strange concept that I've never really understood. You know, many times I've heard people say things about, you know, waiting for God to show up in a situation. Well, I mean, if God is God, he's already there, surely. Instead, what we might be saying when we say stuff like that is we're waiting for the moment when all our desires and expectations for what might happen disappear. And we're immersed in the, in the joy and the flow of this moment. Waiting is the thing that we're waiting for. It's the thing itself. For highly sensitive people, you know, waiting can be our superfood. But if we don't know how to consume and digest it, it can also become kind of kryptonite. It can create anxiety and overthinking and second guessing overstimulation from all the the feelings that might bubble up when we're unsure of what is expected of us next. And as I'll get into shortly, like boredom is also a symptom that can emerge when we haven't reconciled um, or honed our ability to wait properly. It happens when we shut down to our inner worlds, i.e. when we have lots of time but nothing of meaning to fill, fill that time with, or when we have lots of stuff to fill our time but none of it carries any sense of personal meaning or value to us. That's when boredom um, strikes. So let's start with this question. When do we find ourselves needing to wait in life? Like, firstly, like when we're not in control. So if you want to cross a busy road, you need to wait for the green man to tell you that it's safe. Um, Otherwise, you're potentially putting yours and the lives of others at risk. Um, When we're not in control, we must learn to wait until we're able to act. This sort of waiting is demanded of us all the time when we're, you know, waiting for someone else to make a decision, waiting to hear results back from the lab, waiting for payday or for something to grow or even waiting for something or someone to, to die. Most of life is underpinned by waiting for things that we are not in control of. Then there's times when we're in transit. You know, travel is waiting when we're in between, where we're we're sort of between where we are and where we're aiming to get to. Both in physical travel, when we're waiting to arrive, and also in a kind of metaphorical sense, when we're traveling through seasons of life that we have more control over, like, you know, gaining a qualification or moving house or, you know, getting fit and so on. You know, waiting is a part of this movement between places and between moments. Then, um, you know, when we desire, but we don't have the thing that we want. This is a little more abstract than waiting for something outside of your control uh, or waiting for to arrive somewhere you plan to get. There's, there's, there's waiting tied up in our... Um, our longings, our desires, before they become concrete through any kind of action. The waiting we do while we consider something that we have our, our minds or our hearts set on. It's waiting for the resolution of a, a drive that we attach to an external object. We might find ourselves waiting for happiness, waiting for love, waiting for completeness or wholeness. And we attach it to waiting for 
a, a person or a product or an experience. This is like, it's, it's if only, um, uh, if only waiting, which is, is kind of a slippery, sl- slippery soap. Uh, you know, we, we look at certain things around us and combine them with the idea that it would bring us that happiness, that love, that completeness, that peace of mind that we've been waiting for. Then there's the waiting we do in anticipation when we're excited about something or we're afraid about something that's going to happen at some point in the future. But we're not like time is not in sync with where we want to be. You know, we cannot bring the wedding day to to pass any sooner than it is going to. It will arrive when it arrives in its own time at that point in the future. It's the waiting you feel when you say, you know, I can't wait to go on vacation. I can't wait for th- for that vacation. I mean, bad news. You're, you're going to have to wait because it's penned in for like that two week period in July or whatever. It's penned in for a fixed time. It isn't going to come any sooner. You know, like when children feel that kind of desperation, that desperate desire to become an adult. I can't wait to become an adult, and I can, you know, do all these things that adults do, and they, you know, stop me from doing when I'm a child. This anticipatory waiting is a challenge when we are aroused by anxiety or excitement. It's the same feeling of adrenaline and, you know, your heart rate goes. And when you're excited and when you're terrified to do something, it's it's similar processes that go on within us. I can't wait to do this. I can't wait for this to be over. These things are two sides of the same coin. You know, this is one of my biggest waiting challenges myself. You know, it's confusing because you can't, You can kind of think you're dreading something that you're actually really excited about. And when this happens, you know, if we don't have adequate inner tools to process those thoughts, we can sort of experience the dread and we can think I've got to not do that because I'm, I'm dreading it. When actually we're turning away from exciting opportunities, things that do excite us, things that we actually, we can't wait for, but we also can't wait for them to be over. What happens when we refuse to wait? or we spend life uh, looking for ways to avoid waiting. Well, we get easily bored. We get irritable, frustrated, uncreative. We look for things outside of our control to solve our discomfort with the in-between. We want to be entertained. We want to be uh, distracted. We run across in front of traffic. We act irrationally. We subscribe to this notion of endless hustle where action is better than waiting. You've got to do something. Something is better than nothing. We run to the Eurostar while the plane we've booked flies over our heads. We annoy other people by asking them, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And other equivalent questions that emerge when we become adults. We seek quick fixes. We want to get to where we're going and we don't care how we do it. We choose options that compromise our integrity and make choices that are not sustainable in the long run. And ultimately, we miss the beauty that comes inside the space of waiting. When we see waiting as some kind of enemy, we miss out on the true beauty of life. Because it's in the waiting, the in-between moments, the pauses, that life truly happens. That's where growth, development, transition, all of those things take place. Many of our most interesting stories are told from within those moments of waiting, of emerging, of travel, of getting from one place to the next, in between destinations. No one cares that you arrived. We care about how you got there. When I was a kid, I was uh, football mad, uh, as in soccer. I was a massive Manchester United fan before I eventually changed allegiances to Stockport County about the age of 10. Um, And one of my favourite, most anticipated days of the uh, football calendar each year was the FA Cup final day. You know, it didn't really matter to me who was playing, although Man United seemed to play quite a lot. But it, it was just this huge deal. 
you know, an actual game being shown on uh, terrestrial TV for a start, which was special. But it was so much more. It was it was magic. The teams would release songs in the run up to the game. The build up to the match on the on the Saturday itself would go on from early in the morning. Um, and it just it had an air of like Christmas Day magic to me. But the waiting was tough. You know, the day could really drag. So I'd I'd have to kind of keep myself distracted and find other things to do. You know, I'd run out into the garden with a ball, pretend that it was me playing at Wembley in the final, coming back inside every so often with, with my muddy feet to check the time and see how much closer to kickoff we were. Um, but it was exciting and frustrating at the same time. However, I recognised that it was actually the anticipation that made the day special. It was the build-up. It was everything around the game, the speculation, the wondering, the talk about something that no one actually knew the outcome of until it happened. There's something wonderful about that shared experience before um, sport. It's one of the things I love about sport, the time of dreaming and imagination, which leads up to to the main moment and brings meaning to it all. It's the same with international rugby. You know, I've been to Cardiff to watch uh, Wales play countless times over the years and it's always an amazing day out you know in some ways it's as much about the excitement around the streets before the match as it is about the match itself it's not that everybody is like killing time before kickoff but it's the the buzz of anticipation is kind of a part of the event you know people asking one another you know what are oh, like where are you going to be watching the game and uh, there's the sea of red shirts all kind of washing the streets, gradually filing towards the ground. And, you know, like when you get into the stadium, the on-pitch entertainment before the teams come out to sing the national anthems. And the, the, the entertainment is a part of the process of waiting. It's not kind of just killing time and keeping people entertained. It's more than that. It's not distracting us from the fact that we haven't yet got to where we want to be. It's like it is where we want to be. There's deep meaning in the very process of waiting for the thing that we are there to see. That's where memories are left and created because that's where the real emotional connection to the significance of the occasion is is really rooted. You know, people waiting together, anticipating, feeling excited, feeling nervous. This thing that is going to arrive later on. This is creating this emotional bond, this emotional experience within us as individuals and an emotional bond between us as, um, as people. You know, we all know that when it comes to it, like the thing itself is going to be a fleeting moment. It's going to be over in a flash, but that's okay. The fact we can't dwell there for long actually reinforces the significance of it. Then there's the, the lottery. So, um, at its most basic level, we play the lottery because we want um, an instant fix. We, we think, you know, money's going to bring an end to our problems. We dream of winning big bucks overnight. That's going to solve everything. Great. Yeah, that's not really what compels us to play. You know, we know deep down that the chances of us winning are, are very slim. It's, it's pretty much pointless playing the lottery. Yet m- many people still do it. That's because it's actually the waiting. In other words, the not winning. It's actually that that makes the lottery worth doing. And that's, it's, it's that that makes it most exciting. It's the dream of winning that makes it worth buying the ticket because the anticipation of the dream coming true is where the joy is found, far more, ironically, than the, the kind of excitement of actually winning it. You know, yeah, there'd be a few moments of joy if that happened, but then you'd return pretty quickly to a plateau after you realise that you still have problems in life. We know this because it's so often the case with winners and often the case with anyone who makes a dream amount of money or, you know, you get to that next level, um, the the step up in in your salary or a a promotion at work. If we think that money is what's going to bring us perpetual happiness, then we will soon hit rock bottom after realising that we're still unhappy when we get that thing we think we want. And I've got a friend who is a part of a, uh, a syndicate, which won um, a good, I think it was about £20,000 uh, on the lottery, one of the raffles on the national lottery. Uh, it took a couple of thousand each within this syndicate. And the immediate excitement and joy, very real. That was amazing, like a lot of, uh, a lot of very 
kind of excitable, happy people. They're all, you know, great. 2,000 odd pound boost in the bank account. Perfect. But within two days of the win, I was talking to this friend and he seemed, he seemed a bit down. And so I, asked, I, asked, I was like, you know, what's, what's the matter? Like something gone on because you won the lottery at the weekend a couple of nights ago. Yeah, but imagine if we'd won the one million pound prize. That would have been amazing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. And I, I thought, you know, I, I'm not, sh- this, this is a very strange reaction, but I'm not sure it's that out of the ordinary. It actually speaks of something very normal, like the idea of hedonic adaptation, where we quickly return to a relative position of happiness, despite major changes in life, whether that's positive or negative events. We're, we're good as humans at adapting to our new um, circumstances. And he'd returned almost instantly, like, I mean, scarily quickly to that position of normality where the win had no impact on his general level of happiness. It had an effect on his bank account, perhaps, but not on how he was feeling. And rather than understanding that this was because, you know, happiness isn't dependent on the external factor, i.e. winning the lottery, the weird part was that he still pinned potential happiness on winning the lottery. Again, but it just be, need to be more money. So he carried on playing, um, you know, and they put a load of the money from the winnings into continuing to play uh, the lottery in the future, which was a, a, a fascinating thing to me. So you're going to carry on playing even though you've won. And I know you can win again, but like the fact that you won in the first place is like something that most people would never experience. Um, and so they carried on playing, which it's because it wasn't the winning that felt good. It was the wa- waiting to win. It was the possibility he could win. It was the fact that, you know, it's actually the not winning that made the lottery fun to play. It was the fact that he hadn't won the prize above the one that he'd won that made it exciting and worth playing again. We often don't realise that we're not really after the thing we think we're after. And that, in reality, it's the waiting, the anticipating, the dreaming. That's the stuff that gives us a sense of meaningful joy in our lives. And as such, we don't appreciate it as joy because we think we're not where we want to be. So joy, in this sense, turns into into pining and nostalgia, as we looked at in last week's episode, and even anxiety. Peter Rollins says, uh, you know, when you buy a lottery ticket, what you're actually paying for is the desire. It's this in-between, the period of waiting and dreaming, the excitement around what you could do if you won and how your life would change in that situation. And then when the draw is made, your ticket doesn't win, there's a yeah feeling of slight deflation, but not because you didn't win as much as because it takes you away from the enjoyment of waiting and dreaming about what would happen if you did win. You were far happier, you know, 10 minutes earlier before the draw at the, the desire, the possibility that you might win than you are after the draw. And like, as my friend demonstrated, there's a feeling of deflation, even if you do win, because you could have always won more. And this is the same in so many uh, areas of our lives. There's always more we could do, we could have, we could be. But if we're going to, we, we can't satisfy that endless drive for completeness, happiness, oneness, love, peace of mind. And if we don't put that drive into context, it can keep us on that never ending hamster wheel where we cannot wait, but we can never get what we don't want to wait for. It's not about winning. You know, once time takes us away from the event, it's no longer about the result of the FA Cup. It's not about Wales winning in the rugby in Cardiff. And it doesn't matter if you win on the lottery. The moments of meaning are what surrounds these events. In the long view of history, I think back with fondness to match day in Cardiff or the the many match days in Cardiff that I've been to, not not because of a fleeting moment of emotion, you know, on a result, but on what went round, what, what went on around it all. Going through the streets with the anticipation, the hustle, the bustle, the choirs singing Welsh hymns as we wander wander by, the banter shared between opposing fans, and the general atmosphere that 
something special is happening today. It's when extraordinary, ordinary stuff happens. When we're waiting for what we think we're waiting for. That is what brings meaning to our day and to our lives. You know, life is underpinned by anticipation and waiting. Most of our time is spent in that kind of state. But we're so often encouraged to not wait properly. We're told that we need to be constantly entertained, distracted, busy. To repeatedly have to react to things competing for our attention to fill the in-between moments of life. And as such, we fear boredom and we see it as something to avoid at all costs. You know, when a, when a child complains, like, I'm bored, they're often at a crossroads. They're demanding something to entertain them, but also opening up the potential for, like, creativity, for self, self-soothing, creative entertainment of their own making. And we're the same as adults, except we speak to technology and may have the kind of spending to throw money at, at things and at people to keep us from getting bored. You know, I'm bored might result in a shopping trip to buy something to satiate the longing to be entertained. And that might work for a few moments, but soon you'll get bored again. You know, you might have pulled your smartphone out before you even had the chance to think I'm bored, like a pacifier that you shove in your own mouth when you anticipate the foot stomp of frustration as you, as you kind of stuck in a queue at the airport. Boredom is good for us. It teaches us how to cope with waiting. It provides space for creativity and it builds our capacity to grow. When we're bad at being bored, we blame other people and other things for being boring. We feel frustrated that nothing is keeping us busy and entertained and occupied. But as Jules Renard famously said, to be bored is an insult to oneself. Rather than an indictment of other people, what if it says more about us and our our capability to deal with what sits in front of us? Gustavo Rossetti has written a really interesting article on Medium about boredom, uh, which I'll, I'll link to in the show notes. It's called Why Boredom is So Powerful in Life. And it's, uh, it kind of goes through some of the research that's been done into the role that boredom plays in life and, and how it's a, a kind of neutral state, which we choose whether we're going to spin as a, as a positive or a negative yarn. And firstly, he presents the research of uh, John Eastwood, the director of the Boredom Lab at York University, who argues that boredom is a, a crisis of meaning. It's a feeling which invites us to reflect on how we engage with the world. Not anything about who we are as people per se, but more about how we are relating to the world around us. You know, an important part of this is debunking the idea that only boring people get bored which is, you know, certainly something I've thought is possibly true before. But, you know, when people have said, I'm bored, my response has been like, well, that's because you're boring. That's not, not true. No one is boring. And no one is a bored person. It's all about perception and how we allow ourselves to inter- interact and integrate with things around us. Plus, as Eastwood points out, you know, people who suffer from boredom, which is, he suggests fall into two general uh, categories, are not particularly dull they're not dull people you know firstly people with impulsive mindsets who are continually looking for new experiences they can find the world chronically understimulating and on the flip side of that there are those who find the world kind of overstimulating and moreover people who experience the world as a fearful place desiring to not step out of their comfort zone and withdrawing due to a high sensitivity to to pain and to discomfort Um, However, the the comfort that they withdraw into doesn't actually bring any sense of satisfaction as as there's still this kind of desire to be more, to to do more. And this stimulates a chronic boredom within them with this inability to actually satisfy it. Within both of these categories, boredom cannot be satiated. You know, on the one hand, the impulsive mind needs more and more stimulation to kind of keep it interested. And on the other hand, the fearful mind is intimidated by anything that would kind of bring a sense of adventure to the point where they resort to inaction. This is quite an interesting thing to think about and one that I know many highly sensitive people might recognize and resonate with. 
perhaps you feel this tension between sensitivity to the pain and the hostility and the overstimulation of the world but then you get bored when you think about all the things you'd love to actually do if you could overcome the desire to retreat into your comfort zone the waiting that produces boredom can be extremely painful in itself because it's not true rest it's kind of the difference between like genuine self-care are you taking time to um, to step into yourself, to recharge, to steady the ship before, uh, you know, going back out into the world. And self-loathing. Are you believing that you're not equipped to bring your dreams and gifts out into the world because you fear what will happen if you do so? In the space where you engage in the longing to do something but fearing it, you get bored. Dissatisfied but unable to act. Sakyong Mipham, the author of Turning the Mind into an Ally, identifies three kinds of boredom. And I think this is an even more helpful way of kind of approaching this uh, topic, especially if, you know, if there's a danger that we start kind of typing people as, you know, they're a bored, they're, they're someone who gets bored, they're someone who doesn't get bored. Blah, blah, blah. Mipham suggests we can become quite like self-aware and we can take control over how we interact with thoughts of boredom. And the idea that we are bored, rather than reducing it to an issue of uh, like fixed personality, Mipham seems to identify the, the potential underlying sources of boredom instead. Firstly, you know, there's anxiety driven boredom where we're not comfortable with ourselves. This occurs when we're used to being like constantly amused by external stimuli. We're entertained by things outside of us and we associate fun as purely something that occurs, you know, alongside other people, something that happens to us from the outside. So the antidote to boredom is externally driven, perhaps through a device or a platform like, you know, social media or Netflix or some kind of an object that's basically going to rescue us from our boredom. And we don't want to look inwards for solutions to the perceived problem, so we look outside instead. The second kind of boredom is, is sourced from fear. So fear of being alone with and relaxing our minds. This kind of self-confrontation that solitude gives. It brings us face to face with who we are and a sense of inadequacy or loneliness, potentially. A fear of not being enough, somehow. We place boredom in the hands of desire and the drive to avoid the true solution, which is to embrace the space in between and give ourselves over to that space. So we seek solutions outside of ourselves in things in other people in experiences and by re by placing responsibility in the hands of these things to stop us from being bored we're also able to blame them for making us bored uh in the first place when we're, we're not satisfactorily entertained but really all this highlights and demands more of is this insatiable desire to distract ourselves from our anxieties and our fears of looking at ourselves in the mirror and asking well what can i do both these types of boredom are driven by a desire for things to be different from how they are. Things make us bored if they cease or don't satisfactorily distract us from confronting our own thoughts. Whereas the third type of boredom that Mipham uh, highlights is, is an acceptance of boredom itself. The understanding that what really makes us feel bored is our thoughts about things, not the things, not reality itself. This is where we accept boredom as a, as a part of the landscape of life. It's not the world that is predictable, but rather our thoughts about it that are stuck on repeat. And boredom is a state of mind with the process of getting bored being the result of being unable to deal with our repetitive thought patterns. Strangely, the suggestion is you need less, not more, stimulation and novelty. Because if boredom is the result of repetitive thought patterns... And we need to look inwards and change those thoughts, alter how we interact with the world from the inside out. And this is the point at which we tie in with those, uh, those two other ideas, you know, impulsive boredom and boredom from fear. We can learn to control the thoughts we apply to these things. On the one hand, learning to get creative with our thoughts, to produce ideas, to think wildly and outlandishly about what we want to make happen. And on the other hand, to understand the fear of overstimulation is a thought and that the things that truly matter to us, 
are well within our grasp as long as we don't allow ourselves to be to kind of bombard our own minds with complexity and noise and overwhelm. We can change our thoughts about what we're able to do and to do so at a pace and with a rhythm that suits us as individuals. Nietzsche referred to boredom as the unpleasant calm that precedes creative acts. In this sense, creative acts are anything that changes the old record. Creative acts are our thoughts and our responses to things when we step into them and choose to make them different if the old ones are dissatisfying. Boredom is the dissatisfying thoughts we have about our lives. Creative acts are either new ways of thinking or their new ways of doing, seeing, hearing, and engaging with the world. In other words, we get bored when we implement ways of thinking that are not of value to us. And we think we're bored when we believe that we have no ability to change those thoughts. We overcome boredom, not by finding things to distract us from those thoughts, but by actively learning how to deal with boredom within ourselves, by learning how to wait and how to engage the in-between moments of life without needing to fill them with external stimuli or comfort. As Dr. Sandy Mann, the author of The Upside of Downtime, Why Boredom is Good, uh, explains, the, the more entertained we are, the more entertainment we need to feel satisfied. The more we fill our world with fast-moving, high-intensity, ever-changing stimulation, the more we get used to that and the less tolerant we become of lower levels. This resonates again with the idea of the hedonic treadmill of hedonic adaptation where we get faster and faster in the pursuit of pleasure but we never achieve enough to satisfy that desire we return to this plateau this nor this layer level of normality and the levels we reach become normalized at each point on the pathway eventually we get we will get bored again because nothing ultimately satisfies the appetite for entertainment and stimulation but what we need to to kind of feel like we're moving towards satisfaction increases and increases and increases so let's get good at waiting you know it makes us more creative less dependent on things we can consume and be entertained by it makes us more reflective and comfortable in our own skin it invites focus into our lives it reignites our attention and sharpens our discernment over what truly matters it makes us more patient observant intentional about what we do and why We will snack less on mindless, soul-numbing entertainment, which is designed to make us crave more, rather than actually satiating our never-ending need for distraction. We can take charge of our own energy. We can create and spend it in ways that actually mean something to us. We can find joy in the mundane, boring jobs. We can delight in finding meaning in little tasks and everyday chores. Turning these things into meditations. When waiting becomes the thing, we can see the beauty and the value in the in-between. These are the moments that matter. Right now, as you wait for the next thing, as you listen to this podcast, you're in the midst of one of the most meaningful things we have as humans. The ability to wait, to breathe deeply, and to enjoy the wonder of being unproductive. Thank you so much for listening today. I'd love to ask you a massive favor before we go. The best thing you can do to support this podcast other than becoming a patron through Patreon, which you can do so at andymort.com forward slash Patreon, is to rate and comment on the show in your chosen podcast application, wherever you listen to this, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or Google Play. Um, if you just take a minute to, to find the Gentle Rebel podcast there and to leave a quick um, five-star rating, that would be amazing. It, it just helps to get this show and previous episodes of it into more of the ears of people searching for help and support um, with the topics that we're exploring here uh, each week. So I'd be really grateful if you could do that. It'd be amazing. Um, sorry to have gone on a bit long today. My my brain is completely frazzled by <laughs> all of this. Um, hopefully it's been helpful. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, if you do, please come back next time um, and I will be back again in about a week, hopefully, 
um, with another episode of the Gentle Rebel Podcast. Until then, do remember that you are an artist, that the world needs your art. Now go and make somebody's day. Goodbye. Can